Josh Matlaken here with Nicole and Creek. Today we are back in Leven. We are going to the beach later, but for now, we are going to explore. So the last time we were here then, we were way over there and I mentioned that there used to be a harbour in this area. And when we were doing the Bucky Hoose video, I mentioned that this used to be a thriving kind of tourist resort and that a train line used to come in here from Edinburgh and Glasgow. So today, we're going to do a wee bit of urban exploring and see what we can find out about those things. So this path that we're walking on just now is basically uh, runs parallel to where the old railway is. Um, just in all these bushes and stuff, uh, off to my left here, uh, is where the old railway is. In fact, you can just see some of the rails here. So what we're going to do is we're going to follow this road along for a wee bit, uh, up to where uh, a lot of the lines kind of congregated next to one of the old yards. If there's a bustle in your hedgerow, don't be alarmed. It's, uh, in fact, it's, it's Nicole picking brambles. <laughs> I think back in the mid 1800s, there was a, a number of complaints that there weren't sufficient bridges linking Leven to the surrounding areas. One of the things that we've counted just in this short stretch that we've been walking along, when the railway came in, there was an excess of bridges. We just walked under three bridges. Oh, there's the, the sound of the rural car alarm. <laughs> These are big ones. Oh, yeah. Nice. And here we can see where a bunch of the lines come together in front of what is now a real heritage museum. It's just really amazing to think that, you know, back in the late 1800s and right through to 1969, these rail lines can carry people off on their holidays till even. The railway link into Leven from Edinburgh and Glasgow opened in 1854 and initially it was to carry freight. Tourist travel along this line really started off as a commuter service in 1910. Back then in 1910, businessmen from Glasgow uh, who had bought up maybe family homes for the summer along the Fife coast used to use this route so that they could be with their family at the weekend and then travel straight back to Glasgow for work on the Monday morning. By 1911, the service had opened up on a daily basis, meaning that so many more people could come over and enjoy being here in Fife. In the following years, tourism along the Fife coast boomed. Many locals moved into their back gardens and rented their homes out over the summer months. Others rented rooms or let people pitch tent in their gardens. Tourism, much like Victorian lace making, had become a kind of cottage industry and a way for households to bring in a little extra income. By the 1930s, the Fife Coast was accommodating 150,000 tourists during the summer months. Fife's quiet villages offered a calm and restful alternative to the famous seaside resorts like Blackpool or Brighton. Leaven thrived at this time. A beach concert hall was built on the seafront to provide tourists with the sort of entertainment that was not available elsewhere in Fife. An ice cream parlour stood in front of the concert hall, a children's swimming area was built to one side of the building, and on the other side there was very conveniently placed public toilets. The concert hall and toilets are actually still there today. My favourite tourist attraction leaving at this time remains the Bucky House, uh, or the Shell House. It's a seaside fantasy brought to life. It's a place that continues to fill my mind with wonder despite the condition that it's in today. By the 1960s, a combination of events meant that the sun was about to set on Fife's heyday as a tourist destination. 
Although package holiday tours, which had started in the UK in 1950, played a part in attracting people away from Scotland's east coast, the real blow for Fife came with a government proposal popularly called the Beeching Axe. Richard Beeching authored a series of recommendations that had been designed to make the national rail network more profitable. His recommendations suggested closing roughly 5,000 miles of rail track and around 2,300 stations. Most of these closures impacted heavily on rural areas like Fife, but the impact was felt across the entire UK. Tourism in Leven was significantly impacted by the closure of the local line and the station. The town went from a thriving hub of summer activity to the quiet seaside town that we see today. To be sure, people still come to Leven for a quiet holiday, they're not at anything like the numbers that they used to. Further blows to Leven would follow in the coming years, but we're going to have to wait until the next time we come to Leven to look at that. So that's uh, effectively what's left of the rail link. It's very windy here, I think we want to move over to get a little bit of shelter. So, yeah, we have this wall over here, I think we're going to hide behind that to try and shelter ourselves a little from the wind. You said you had a, a very <laughs> cool piece. Well, it's cute. It's not particularly well frosted, but because I love a pictorial pottery piece, uh, I'll tell you what's on it. Uh, it was okay. a little difficult to identify. You see, it's a teddy bear with a little pink bow oh yeah you just see yeah, it yeah we see that <laughs> it's really cute it's probably a bit more modern and from a from a children's cup but we'll definitely take that that's quirky yeah yeah that's sweet so i heard a happy noise what have you found yeah. It looks like it's a ginger beer bottle. Okay, where is it? Do you well, want to point out? It's just over here. I can see there's some writing on ah, it. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Just huh? a second. Yeah, we see that, we see that. Do you want to take that out? Yeah. It's done. There's a lot of writing on it. Oh, that is amazing. That really is cool, isn't it? There's a lot of writing on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Wixtonshire Creamer from the Wixtonshire Creamer Stranra and you see there's a little milkmaid on it you, know you can sort of just see the skirt and the, the legs find of the day well yeah so far <laughs> the piece of pottery we found in Leven travelled the country from west coast to east it was manufactured for the Wixtonshire Creamery Company in Stranra the creamery originally stood right across from the harbour where the railway connected Scotland's coast. I like to imagine that a businessman back in 1910 picked a jar like this up as a treat to take to his family when he popped over for the weekend. Running to catch a train on a Friday evening so that he could get to Leven to bring a jar of luxurious potted cream to his wife and children so they could enjoy a real treat together by the seaside. Our little cream pot has a lovely sepia tone print of a milkmaid, her three-legged milking stool and a bucket. Well, it did when it was in one piece. Cream pots made for the Wigtonshire Creamery between 1888 to 1912 had a brown transferware print. After 1912, the company switched to a black transferware label. So, we can accurately date our beach found treasure. Details like this can help to date these mass-produced pots which were made throughout Britain before being branded differently for each dairy. There's nothing left of the former Wigtonshire Creamery buildings, but the cream pots have survived in one shape, form or another and are now collectible pieces of history.
So we just spotted a couple of pieces of ceramic. This one is definitely a heavy, heavy piece. I think that's maybe like a wall tile, maybe even a floor tile. Yeah, or it could be from a Victorian fireplace. Oh yeah. The tiles that were around the fireplaces. Yeah. That looks really lovely. Okay, I'll, I'll let Nicole have a wee look at that and mm -hmm. I'll go and have a wee look at this piece here. Yeah. That we spotted as well. Uh -huh. Looks much more like a, the kind of thing you'd see on a plate maybe. Yeah, yeah. Could be mocha ware. We'll put them next to one another. Yeah. But you look at the size difference and the thickness, that's definitely a tile. The pattern looks a little bit older than the 70s. I mean, the colour would suggest, well, maybe Victorian Art Deco, that kind of green. That arsenic. Arsenic green, that's right. Uh, and then you've got this lovely piece of pottery. They're nice. Yeah. Quite a lot of these uh, pottery shards around today. Really thick piece. Obviously a, a bottle, I think, of some kind. Oh, right, yeah. yeah. Well, they're quite big. Big pieces of a jar, yeah. These are really quite big pieces of shards and they're really quite uh, shiny still, aren't they? Yeah, I think they've probably been buried. Uh, yeah, quite likely. But uh, they're definitely very, very big. We'll leave this here, a little bit big for our project. Yeah. What was it you said? Oh, I think I see it. Is it just yeah. the shard? Yeah, it's just that piece of pottery there. It's always worth flipping a piece of pottery over just to see if there's a pattern on the other side. So I just picked these up here uh, and there's nothing on either side of them. So they're just plain, but I've just seen this piece and I'm going to give I'm going to flip it over for okay. you. Huh? Okay, cool, yeah. Oh, uh -huh. what is that? There's something writing on that. Yeah, it's from a ginger beer bottle. You think that says Jamaican ginger? Uh, <laughs> no, it says, um, what's the ginger beer maker in uh, Kakadi? That's where it's from. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll, we'll look that up. <laughs> well, we'll give you a, a whole picture of what the bottle looked like in an insert. <laughs> okay, cool. nice wee bit of a sea foam. That looks to me, could it be, could it be? I don't think it's a piece of bottleneck, but it's still a nice wee piece of sea foam. <laughs> Thank you. Ah. Yeah. A bit of pottery. Yeah, we've got a wee piece of pottery here. Yeah. I can see one just over here. I'll, and, and yeah, a nice wee piece of uh -huh. uh, green pottery you found there yeah. as well. That looks really nice. Two different kinds of pottery here your transfer wear there with the really distinctive patterns that one looks more like it's just got a bit of glaze on it hard to tell from the size yep no but they're both really nice yeah they're really lovely there's a oh, lovely yeah, I see it I see it yeah a lovely piece of transfer wear that's really nice oh that is very nice it looks like it has grass on it yeah it's interesting isn't it yeah I, that's really nice really nice pattern yeah, well, we'll take that. Mm. This was such a lovely piece. The grassy pattern reminded me of the fields along this coast. It's harvest time now, but we look forward to spring and new growth. I think the pattern reflects that kind of positive energy. Okay, so most pieces that we find are shaped in a way that they can be top drilled. Now this piece is a little wider and in order to make sure that it hangs perfectly I'm going to drill it on either side. This also means I'm going to have to split the chain, so let's see how we can do that.
So we've drilled the hole, we've cut the chain, now we just need to fasten the bales to the chain. So that's that necklace made now. I think it turned out really lovely and the bales have a uh, reflect the kind of grassiness of the structure. I'm going to put it in the Etsy shop and then I'm also going to make this ginger beer bottle piece into another necklace. We received so many lovely comments on the Christmas tree pendants that we made last week that we decided to make a pair of matching earrings like these. So once we get going you'll notice that there are quite a few similarities in uh, making the earrings and how I made the Christmas tree pendant. We've put a link with the PDF instructions on how to make the Christmas tree in the description. So between watching this and the PDF you should be well covered. If you like the look of the earrings or the pendant but just don't have the time to make them check out our Etsy shop. So what you need is six pieces of centre drilled C-class, that's three for each earring, two head pins, two French hooks, and a couple of beads, and a pair of nose pliers and a pair of bent nose pliers. I've chosen green C-class and red beads to give these earrings a really Christmassy look. Now we're going to start with the head pin and you'll see that the sea glass is getting smaller just to give it a really good tree shape. So you'll start with the biggest piece of sea glass and you thread that onto your head pin. Now you'll do, keep doing that with the other pieces of sea glass. You see I've already pre-drilled these. If you need any advice on drilling, check out our drilling video, how to drill sea glass. Now I'm going to add the bead. And you can already see it's looking quite like a Christmas tree. Okay, now what you want to do is you want to keep a hold of this head pin and you want to take your nose pliers. We are going to try and create a little loop on the top. And what you need to do is you need to push this head pin away from you. And you'll see there is a little bit of space between the top of the bead and the head pin. And we are going to need that now. I'm going to push this away from me depending okay you can see it's been and this is where my second pair of pliers comes in really handy because now we need to create the loop and we'll need to pull back the head pin towards ourselves it's a little difficult at a distance okay I'm gonna try and do this I'll hold it against the camera okay now we're going to Hold on to that head pin and hold the little loop that we've just created and just loop the end of the head pin around the top. This is because we want the sea glass and the bead to be secured and not moving too much. Now this is a little bit of a tricky part here and There's usually a little tiny bit of a uh, head pin left there and that's the bit you want to bend in with the plier so there's no sticky bits sticking out. Okay, and that's it. That's your first little tree made. Now I'm taking uh, these uh, French hooks, all the components are sterling silver and what I'm going to do is you'll see there's a little hook at the end of this, uh, this earring hook and we need to open that ever so slightly and I'm going to go in with my nose pliers, hold on to the hook and open 
open it up just a little bit, just enough so that we can hang that tree in there. If you've got French hooks that have these little balls here, just take care that the ball doesn't fall inside the hoop. Now I'm going to just push this in here. And now we need to close that hoop. And this is what the first earring looks like and now we just need to make the second one so we've got a pair. So there you go, that's your Christmas tree earrings made. I think they look really cute. If you wanted to, you could uh, swap the bead for a little uh, kind of star charm uh, or anything else that you like. But I've chosen these and I really like them. Thank you all so much for liking, subscribing and commenting and a special thanks as always goes out to our Kofi supporters. Thank you so much and bye, see you next Friday.